Hi, and welcome to this first of a three-part video series on the 123 Block project. In this first video, we're going to be looking at stock preparation, surfacing on a milling machine. We're going to be looking at some layout work. We're also going to be looking at positioning and center drilling holes on the milling machine. In the second video, we're going to be looking at drilling, counterboring, and countersinking holes on a drill press. We're also going to be looking at tapping, letter and number stamping, and heat treatment. In the third video of this series, we're going to be looking at surface grinding and finishing. So, let's get to it. Everything starts with a good cleanup. Oil and grease should never come in contact with a file because a file that has oil or grease on it won't cut properly. So always start by ensuring that your part is good and clean. It's important to hold your part securely in a vise. This will liberate your hands and you'll be able to use both hands for the deburring operation. Deburring is important. It's important for safety because obviously a part that has sharp edges on it isn't safe and it's important for precision because a part with burrs on it will not sit properly in a vise. We want to work accurately and safely so no burrs allowed. Burrs aren't the only problem. Nicks and bumps can also cause the part to be misaligned in the vise. So inspect the part properly and remove any imperfections before continuing on to the next phase. Before starting the project, it'd be good to familiarize ourselves with the different components that make up a vertical milling machine. For starters, let's look at the milling machine's head. A milling machine's head incorporates a drive motor for the spindle, a transmission for the spindle speed and the control panel to turn it on and off, as well as obviously the spindle itself. Now the spindle on these machines also has an axial movement or a quill movement that is generally used for drilling. And please, if you're not using it for drilling, make sure it's locked. In the center and towards the back here we have the column and the column is the part that incorporates the vertical ways and it joins the head to the foot or the base of the machine. On the column is mounted the knee. On the knee is mounted the saddle and on the saddle is mounted the table. It's on this work table that we're going to fix the parts to be machined. Our work table has three linear axes of motion. Now, the first and most important axis is the X axis. And it's activated by the X axis hand wheel and lead screw at the end of the table. We also have the transverse or Y axis that's activated by the hand wheel right here at the front of the machine. And finally we have the Z axis or if you prefer the vertical axis and it's activated by this large hand wheel at the front. It's large because we need some leverage here. Each axis on this machine incorporates a graduated collar that will help us to move the table a very accurate amount. But this machine also incorporates a digital readout and that digital readout will indicate to us the table's position with great accuracy. This milling machine also incorporates an automatic feed gearbox that runs on its own motor separate from the motor of the spindle. For this first project on the mill, we're not going to be using the automatic feed and to make the hand wheels a little easier to turn, we're going to make sure to leave it in neutral. And as always when setting up a machine, don't forget to activate the emergency stop button. 
Many people think that shops are dirty places, and it's just not the case. To work precisely, you have to work very cleanly. Any dirt or particles that would be situated between a part such as this precision vise and the machine will skew its positioning and make for inaccurate work. Just because they're heavy and massive doesn't mean that a milling machine vise and a milling machine aren't precision instruments. Treat them delicately. Deposit the vise softly on the table. Use the T-nuts provided with the machine to fix the milling machine vise to the milling machine table. Make sure you use both T-nuts and tighten them down very well. Remember, surfacing is a bi-dimensional operation, so a visual alignment of the vise is all that's required at this stage of the project. Make sure that your spindle taper is clean and that the emergency stop button is activated before installing the cutting tool. For the surfacing operation, we're going to use a carbide insert shell end mill that incorporates an MMT-30 taper and a camlock quick change. The MMT-30 taper is a positioning taper. It's not made to lock the tool in part. You have to use a drawbar or a cam lock with an MMT-30. Most tools turn in a clockwise direction, so this cam lock, as is the case for most cam locks, is locked in an anti-clockwise direction. Make sure that it's really well tightened down. We can now install our block in the vise. Remember, it's our tertiary surface we want to mill here, because our primary and secondary surfaces are already to size. Avoid positioning the part to one side or the other of the vise, or sticking it out too much. The part should be held towards the center of the vise, sticking out the least amount possible. It's important at this stage to position the part noticeably crooked in the vise and to tighten the vise down just lightly. It's also important for this first cut that the part doesn't touch the bottom of the vise. I can now position my secondary reference surface perpendicular to the bottom of the vise and thusly position it perpendicular to the surface of the milling table by using this precision solid square and a dead blow hammer. Once in position, you can tighten the vise down. You need to tighten it really well. To avoid back injuries, tighten by pushing down on the handle. And to avoid groin injuries, keep your body close to the handle's fulcrum. Remember, you can use a dead blow hammer to loosen a vise handle but if I see anyone tightening a vise handle with a dead blow hammer, I will go ballistic. You can now center your tool visually on the part in the Y axis. For this material and cutter, we're going to want 900 RPM. So B, 1, 2. So I set my gears to B, and I set my two-speed electric motor to 1. And now very important that it's done with the spindle turning, I adjust my adjustable pulley to the number 2 setting. It's very important for safety that a tool approaching a part be in rotation. So with the tool rotating, bring the part so that it's just barely above the surface of the part that you want to machine. And then, using the Z-axis, bring the part up to the tool so that it just barely skims the surface of the part. And then, using your X-axis, pull the tool off of the surface of the part. Remember, shell mills cut on their sides, not on their face. Now that we know where the shell end mill is in relationship to the part, we can set our z-axis to zero and position our z-axis to the first depth of cut, a cut of about 0.3 millimeters. Using a rapid but constant feed rate, notice the speed at which I'm turning the hand wheel, take your first cut. It's important to maintain that constant feed rate right up to the point when the tool has completely cleared the part. 
It is crucial to wait for the tool to stop turning completely and to activate the emergency stop button before inspecting or removing the part from the milling vise. Each cutting operation produces burrs, so get used to removing them each time you move the part from one setup to another. After all, you want your next operation to be just as accurate as the one that you've just completed. We can now cover one of the primary reference surfaces with a thin coat of layout blue and lay out a line at 76 millimeters from the first tertiary reference surface, the one that we've just produced. We're going to square up our second tertiary surface using the first or the reference surface that we've just produced. And for that we're going to use the smallest parallel possible up against the fixed jaw of the vise on which we're going to sit our part, making sure that the reference surface that you've just produced is the one that's facing the parallel. It's important to sit the part on the parallel using a dead blow hammer. Remember, if you re-tighten the vise after seating the part, you have to reuse the dead blow hammer and reseat the part again. We can now start over the same series of operations that we had completed for the first tertiary end of the part. So, in the z-axis I just come and skim the surface of the part, I pull the part back, I reset my digital readout to zero, and take a first depth of cut in z. Approximately 0.3 millimeters here will do the trick. We can continue taking successive cuts in the same fashion until our surface comes very close to the 76 millimeter line we laid out earlier. Remember, there's a limit to how much material we can take off in one pass. So, since we're just starting out, we're going to limit ourselves to 0.3 millimeters at a time. Once we have a better handle on how speeds, feeds, depth of cut, rigidity of the part, and stability of the setup interact one with the other, we'll be able to augment our rhythm of production and take deeper and heavier cuts. Once that we've just barely skimmed the line that we've laid out, we can measure the part to ensure that it is situated somewhere between 75.8 millimeters and 76.2 millimeters. Okay, so my block is rough cut to its pre-grinding dimension and it's squared up. We can see here that we have a primary reference surface, a secondary reference surface, and a tertiary reference surface. These surfaces come in pairs, so I have two primaries, two secondaries, and two tertiaries. I've already coated my primary and secondary surfaces opposite my reference surfaces with a thin coat of layout blue. No layout blue is required on the tertiary surfaces. Since there can only be one reference surface per pair of surfaces, and this is very important, well, I'm going to lay out a small X in the corner closest to the intersection of my primary and secondary reference surfaces. It's important not to lose track of that reference point because it's from those two reference surfaces that all the holes and entities on the part are going to be laid out. 
from those reference surfaces, not from any other surfaces. If we look at the drawing, we can see that the part should measure 75 millimeters by 50 millimeters by 25 millimeters. I can also see on the plan that the whole positions are indicated from those finished dimensions. But at this point, our part measures about 76 millimeters by 50.8 millimeters by 25.4 millimeters, the last two dimensions being quite accurate. So we're going to have to compensate for that over dimension that we've left there for finishing. So I won't be laying out my first line at 12.5 millimeters as indicated on the plan. Rather, I'm going to be laying it out at 12.5 plus half the over dimension that I've left for finishing. In this case, the part measures 50.8 in this plane, so I'm going to lay it out at 12.9 millimeters. On the drawing, we can see that our next line is at 25 millimeters, so we're going to lay it out at 25.4 millimeters. Make sure that you're still laying out from your secondary reference surface. You don't want to flip your block. We have only one line left to lay out in this secondary plane, and that line should be laid out at 37.5 millimeters. Now, since we left, 0.8 millimeters over dimension on this plane, we're going to lay it out at 37.9 millimeters. With your tertiary reference surface against the surface plate, we can now lay out our lines in that tertiary surface. But in this case, things are going to be a little different because each student has cut his own block to somewhere around 76 millimeters. It's not accurate like the secondary plane was. So in this case, I can't give specific dimensions. All we can say is that each student is going to have to add half the over dimension of their part to the dimensions indicated on the drawing. And there we have it, our layout lines. We can see the X that indicates our reference corner and we can see where each hole needs to be produced. Use the long line short line technique to ensure that there is an intersection only where there's going to be a hole because unnecessary intersections create a lot of confusion. We're now ready to move on to the center drilling of our holes. We're going to be positioning those holes using the XY axis and the digital readout. That means that our vise is going to have to be very well aligned because this is a three-dimensional operation. So we can replace our shell end mill with a drill chuck in which we're going to install a dial indicator. We can now loosen just lightly one of the two T-nuts that are holding down the vise. The other T-nut will be completely loosened off. This will create a pivot point around which we'll be able to rotate our vise and that will help us to align the fixed jaw with the axis of the table. Once the vise jaw is aligned with the table we can re-tighten the T-nuts progressively. Once everything's tightened down re-indicate the vise jaw one last time to make certain that everything is still lined up. Okay, our vise is cleaned and properly aligned, so we can now install two parallels to support the part. Since the part's primary reference surface is going to be sitting on these parallels, and that the part's width is much greater than the height of contact between the part and the vise, we're going to require two parallels. Once that the piece is well tightened down, we're going to use our dead blow hammer to ensure that the part is well seated against the parallels. We're going to use a spring-loaded edge finder to edge find the part and determine where our reference surfaces are. We're going to edge find in X and in Y and then we're going to set our digital readout to zero in both axes. Producing guide holes for drilling requires the use of center drills. Now, this center drill is short and rigid, 
and will position the hole much better than a long series jobber drill. For this number 4 center drill, we're going to require somewhere around 8 or 900 RPM. These center drills aren't made to drill through holes. Only about two-thirds of the 60 degree V end of the center drill should penetrate the work surface, never more. With the spindle stopped and the drill pushed down into the hole that I've just produced, I can set my depth stop and this way I'll get uniform depth on all my other center drilled holes on this surface. Now all we have to do is move to the coordinates of the other holes and drill them one after the other. You may be wondering why we laid out the holes if we were going to move to the coordinates using the digital readout. Well, we did it for a safety backup because edge finding operations, when not done correctly, usually have large mistakes. It's rarely out by just a bit. These laid out lines will help us to determine if our edge finding and setting up of our digital readout was done properly. You know the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And there you go. Our eight holes have been center drilled. Now, you may have noticed that I haven't given any coordinates for the XY positioning of the holes on that primary surface. And the reason is simple. It's because we've seen two methods of edge finding. Now, we can edge find and work from a reference point, which is the corner of the part, or we can edge find to work from the center of the part. And obviously, depending on the method that you choose, well, the coordinates are going to change. You will also notice that I haven't done the three holes on the secondary surface of the part. That's one of the perks of teaching. All I have to do is demonstrate the general principle. And since we've seen that in the primary surface holes, well, I'm not going to redo it for the secondary surface holes. I'm going to take the easy road. After all, I am the lazy machinist. So my holes are positioned and center drilled. And as far as this project is concerned, that's all we needed to do on the mill. So we can now cross over the shop and head towards the drill press for the second part of this three-part series on the 123 block. So, see you there, be safe, and remember, happy machining.